Hello out there, horror fans, and welcome to episode 73 of Funny Book Splatter, a horror comics podcast brought to you by HorrorTalk.com. I am your host, James Ferguson. This week's guest is Michael Sambrook, one of the minds behind Griff Gristle and the horror anthology comic Horror. Michael is part of a group of creators in the UK steadily pumping out some solid indie comics, so I've been eager to speak to him. Unfortunately, this interview gets cut short due to some day job responsibilities. I intend to have Michael back on the show soon, along with some of his colleagues from the DS Comics. Michael will be tabling at Glasgow Comic Con this Saturday, June 30th, where he'll have copies of Horror Air number 3 available in print for the first time. This was first released in digital this past Halloween. Horror Air is carrying on the tradition of classic horror anthology comics like Tales from the Crypt and Creepy. Michael can be found on Twitter at Rapiachi, uh, that's R A P I A G H I. And you can follow along with Medeus Comics on Twitter at Medeus Comics. I really hope I'm pronouncing that right. And uh, finally, you can find Michael's work on the Comic House app, as well as at paykip.com slash All right, that is it for the news and updates. So now, on with the show. Here is episode 73 of Funny Book Spider with my guest, Michael Sambo. All right, so to start us off, uh, how would you describe horror to someone? I, I've, been pro- I've been practicing pr- pronouncing it all day, horror how would you how would you describe that to someone uh, if you were to on the convention floor, which you will be at Glasgow? Yeah. Uh, how would you describe that to someone? It's basically our love letter to horror as a genre. Um, we try and cover essentially everything that horror is and everything that horror means to us, and try and push it in strange and interesting directions. Whether that's following a narrative idea, whether it's a theme we want to explore, a trope we want to play with, or something like that, but. Essentially, each story is sort of like a mini love letter to something that, that we love or find interesting within horror itself. And um, everybody kind of comes to us with different ideas, you know, whether the artists that we're collaborating with have little ideas they want to explore. And then me and Rob, the writers, will then, you know, kind of expand and flesh out or whether it's something that we ourselves want to explore. Um, but we try and hop around, really, and keep it as varied as possible because I think horror means different things to different people. So we like to try and give a little something for everyone, really. Yeah, that's you kind of hit the nail on the head with that. I, I mean, horror, there are so many aspects to the genre that provide, you know, a little something for everyone. So if you're into zombies, there's that. If you're into, you know, vampires, if you're into, like, more moody stuff, if you just want to see someone's head get ripped open, with, you know, with a machete, that, those all those things exist. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, I mean, first off, the, the name is a, it seems a little weird, mm-hmm. but I mean, how, how do you, how did that come about? Well, um, originally the book came about through, um, me, Alistair Wood, and Rob Jones. Um, the three of us were sort of talking about wanting to do an anthology, wanting to explore horror, and, and, um, we wanted the kind of theme of it to be very rooted in horror. And I mean, there's so many different anthologies, there's so many riffs on, you know, the word horror itself and, you know, different things like that. But we wanted something a little bit stranger. So through a bit of digging, um, it was actually Alistair's suggestion. And horror is actually an old Latin word that actually means um, to kind of shudder or have your hair stand on end. So it's almost like an old Latin sort of almost precursor to the word horror as we know it today. So it's more to kind of, you know, throw back to kind of the olden times, but then also to kind of just give the idea that we want to unsettle and just kind of, you know, make those hairs on the back of your neck stand up. But then also with it being a short title, it means that it's going to stand out, you know, it has impact and people are going to recognize and remember it. So it kind of just hit all the nails on the head. It was one of the first, if not the first suggestions for the name and nothing really ever came close or felt more right than that so it just it just stuck that's really cool i like that you know you kind of you, ha- you have a historical um, reference for it that's it that's yeah. really no, that's no a, one's that's really a kind of solid thing. mentioned that or picked up on that so i don't know if it's something that we just enjoy but um, <laughs> you know, that was the, the thought process behind it anyway yeah, I can just imagine that it could it could wreak havic with uh, your Google search results. Uh, I oh. guess because it's probably just going to be like, "Hey, do you mean horror?" Like, I, I, we know you spelled this wrong. Nightmare. Um, when we're vanity searching ourselves, which we never do, um, it's impossible to get it on the first time because autocorrect <laughs> always kicks in. So yeah, Google is not our friend when it comes to that at all. 
Well, I guess it, it it should hopefully learn over time that like no 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 this is what I this is what I meant. Yeah, Come you'd, on, you'd think, wouldn't you? You would think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're 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 monitoring everything else. They should probably know that. <laughs> Google, if you're listening. <laughs> yeah, we, we know you are. Come on. <laughs> <clears throat> so you so you guys are are you don't write every single story that's within uh, horror, Air, but you you also like kind of serve as the editor. You're you're writing some of the stories. So how do, how does that kind of dual role work because you're, you're wearing all these multiple hats to put a book like this together. Yeah. Um, well, I'm not sure if you're that familiar with our other output because uh, me and, oh, and I, I most definitely am. We, uh, Griff Gristle's on the list too. Uh, and, I, and you know, you guys have this like cool, like comic collective out there yes. between like a group of you that just all seems to like work together to make really cool comics. That's basically exactly it. Yeah. So we kind of, the collective is Madius comics and, um, Herrera is kind of half in, half out of Madius, um, because it's a boring history I won't go into, but essentially Madius is kind of a banner that kind of encompasses most of the things that we do. And one of the very first things that we ever did um, was Paper Cuts and Ink Stains, which was an anthology that was anything goes, basically. But opposed to it being an anthology with many different writers and artists, it was more an anthology where we wrote everything and then we brought in loads of different artists to kind of keep that really varied feel that you normally get with an anthology. And the kind of variation in the writing we wanted to have by us hopping genre all over the place. So in Paper Cuts and Ink Stains, you know, you've got sci-fi, you've got fantasy, you've got even some touches of horror in there, romance. There's literally anything goes in that. Um, so... The idea of an anthology that we write most of, if not all of, was actually where we started. So even though it might not be sort of a traditional and normal process, to us it, it, it is. So when we got onto Herrera, that was basically Paper Cuts and Ink Stains exclusively for horror. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's how the approach of wanting to kind of really touch on all the different corners of horror as a genre came to be. Because of us essentially being the writer's of, of most, if not all the stories, um, we wanted to make sure that there was variety in the content itself. You know, it wasn't just a million explorations of zombies or, or vampires. You know, we were hopping all over the place. And again, I mean, Magius Comics and everything that we've done under that, it's all us. Um, we basically are the publishers, the writers, the editors, the, the PR, the, um, you know, we pack the orders. We, we do everything ourselves. So the editorial side of it, it's, it's more of a role that I fell into more than anything because me and Rob are basically the writers and Rob also is the letterer and he handles an awful lot of the logistics side as well. So I kind of, you know, pull into the editorial side, whereas he goes more into the lettering and logistics side there. And it's more that we've just kind of fell into roles that suit what we do well, really. Um, to start with, it was a bit sort of push and pull and we, you know, have our toes in every single, you know, pull. But as we've kind of been working on this for, I think, we're our fourth, fifth year of working together now, me and Rob, we've kind of found what we do well and we've kind of lent into that. And yeah, it's, it's one of those things again that it might seem strange for us to be, you know, writers, you know, editors and, and doing all these different tasks. But to us, it's the way that we've always worked. Actually working in a more traditional way, you know, with other publishers always feels very strange to us when we're not fully in control of everything. Um, in regards to the other people that we've brought in, um, in the second issue of Herrera, um, and the Halloween special that we did as well, we've had a guest story in both of those issues. And really, it wasn't something that we ever planned on doing to start with. And it was more to do with the fact that people contacted us and, and loved the issues, loved what we were doing and wanted to be a part of it with us and sent over these, these finished pieces that they were either struggling to find homes for elsewhere or came to us first with because they just wanted to, you know, be associated with, with the actual book itself or people just starting out and not really knowing, you know, where to take these stories and where to go with them. And just the strength of the content basically dictated that we, we had no choice really. They had to go in. They were great. Um, and I mean, you know, th- these are just all cool people as well. You know, we've made really good friends with them along the way and, Anything that we can do to kind of give a platform to anyone's work that we like and any way we can sort of share our spotlight, we're, we're always willing to do. So, again, you know, going forward, if more people get in touch, if, if more stories get lined up, absolutely, you know, we'd love to include that. Um, we're always open for, you know, at least a guest story in, in, in every issue that we put out. 
that's got to be a great uh, compliment too. That if it's like, hey, this is really cool. Like, I need to find a way to be a part of this um, outside absolutely. of just being yeah. inundated with uh, with different submissions. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think when people come to us, they're not sort of just trying to chase um, a paycheck, so to speak. And I mean, obviously, everyone deserves to be paid for their work. I'm not saying that at all, but more so. They're coming to us because they want to be a part of what we're building. And like you say, that's just the, the biggest compliment that we could ever have, that what we're doing, people want to be a part of. It just shows that obviously we're doing something right. And, you know, obviously I never want that to end. <laughs> yeah, really. Uh, now, now, have have you and, and Rob have been working together long for comics? Like, is that something like you guys, you know, do you guys go back far in terms of like your friendship? And then it's just, hey, let's make comics. Weirdly, no. I mean, we almost started working together instantly. Um, we met through Twitter, and to be honest with you, all of her air really came through Twitter. I, you know, we all met each other, all the artists, and everybody all came together through Twitter, really. And it was more just me and Rob ended up just kind of accidentally bumping to, into each other, just talking about comics um, through mutual, 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 mutual friends, you know, where it's so disconnected that it's barely connected mm-hmm. anymore. And we just found that we had similar opinions about things. We found similar things funny. We're, you know, about exactly the same age. I think we're separated by like a, about a week. Um, and then he also came from music previously, like I did. We both used to be in bands, you know, a few years ago. And there was just a huge amount of parallels between our lives. And we were both actually late coming to comics as well. We both only really started getting into comics in our sort of, um, mid to, no, I'd say yeah, about mid twenties, really. So we were both kind of coming into the world of comics as adults, and both kind of muddling, you know, through it as fans at the same time. So we kind of, you know, started talking more and more and more and more through that. And then Rob started actually doing a a column for a website where he was sort of talking about what it was like to come into comics this late in life, and he was always looking for recommendations and things like that, and. Talking through all of that is how we really started to connect. And originally, he came to me and said, I fancy writing a comic. Would you like to draw? And, you know, I I doodle a little bit, but I'm not an artist. And at the time, I was was drawing a lot more. So I was like, yeah, I mean, let's give it a go. So we started collaborating where I was doing, you know, pieces of concept art and things like that. And we sort of rapidly realized that my art was not up to where it needed to be. To, to release anything that I was going to be happy with. And so what we decided to do was I basically said, look, I love what we've built so far. I'll help you finish the script. We'll get that script tight as anything. And then we will find an artist to work on it. And we actually found that when we started working on the writing together, it just clicked. Mm-hmm. And we just found that we just gelled so, so well together because he plugs every gap I've got and I plug every gap he's got in terms of our skills. Um, you know, we're, we're better at different things and the way that those sort of skills overlay, it gives us a very complete set of skills between us. And I think we both have the same attitude where we're not precious about our work. All that we care about is that the story is as good as it can possibly be. And looking back on some of the scripts from a couple of years ago, I honestly couldn't even tell you which ideas are mine and his anymore. You know, the way that these things blur, it's like the way that we've always described it is one of us will present a lump of clay to the other one. And then that person takes that lump of clay, plays with it a little bit, shapes it somewhat into something and passes it back. Then the next person takes what they've been given and continues to shape it into what feels like the right shape based on how it was given to me. And then we just keep playing with it until we get to a point where we both look at it and go, oh, that's perfect. That's finished. And that usually means taking out, you know, pieces of other people's work. You know, sometimes I'll just erase whole sections of his. He'll erase whole sections of mine. Rechange just things. If they just don't sit right, they've yeah. got to go. And we're both pretty ruthless, but not precious, if you see what I mean. It's like we both have an eye for what works. And it stops you getting sort of, you know, lost in the weeds. You know, it stops you kind of overanalyzing and drilling too far into your own mind when you know that someone's going to come in with a blowtorch. Um so it just it forces us to kind of keep moving and just stick with what works and and um that's I think as well what helps us do as much as we do is that we're constantly sort of picking each other up because I think when you're working on your own you can labor over a single page for weeks months sometimes whereas when someone else comes in and looks at it they can just go have you thought about that 
and it just it just instantly blows your mind it was just you know an aspect you weren't considering it was just a way that you weren't thinking and then you're off yeah. and running again then it just it stops those kind of moments where you just get lost i think essentially so yeah i mean we um we just knew sort of pretty early on that it was right and i think again we both like doing different things and pushing ourselves in different directions and sort of taking risks as well um we're not afraid to, to get something wrong I think, you know, cause again, like, I think when I was a bit younger, I was always paranoid that everything had to be perfect. Everything, everything you put out has to be absolutely perfect, but it's, perfection doesn't really exist. And I think knowing when something is done and ready, and that idea is as realized as it can be, just putting it out there. And I think that collaborative work with Rob has made me a lot more confident, you know, to, to just get work out there. Well, I think you're learning a valuable skill there and that, uh, you know, being able to kill your darlings there is, is yeah. incredibly valuable. And then you have this kind of like built in, um, proofreader for everything and like, you know, call, call you out Absolutely, on your bullshit, yeah. but also praise you on the stuff that, yeah. that works out well. And that, that makes for yeah. a good collaboration. That's it. Absolutely. Yeah. I think that's something that we, we're both good at is that we will only fight when we know we're right. Um, and there's been a couple of times, there's been a couple of times where, you know, like we've disagreed on exactly which direction to go in, but we both have the attitude of, you know, choose your battles. And if the other person is incredibly passionate about one particular aspect, then they're probably right. You know, and that's just something that we tend to go with. But it, I honestly can't think that we've ever really butted heads for longer than like an hour on a particular point. We always, you know, find a way to move it forward that we're both happy with. Um, but yeah, it's, I think it's something that's helped an awful lot. Um, and again, when it comes to, you know, reviews and, and things like that further down the line, you're less sort of precious about it because it's something that you've built as a group, if that makes sense, you know, through the art as well. And it's such a collaborative thing that, you know, you don't get too hung up on all the subtext and things that you wanted in there, even though we have a bunch of that. <laughs> That's, that's, that's awesome. I mean, look, it's, it's made for some pretty good comics between, you know, what, what you guys have put out with the Medeus, uh, am I pronouncing that right? Med, 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 Medius. Uh, Medius, we tend to, <laughs> but uh, to be honest, we change these pronunciations daily ourselves. <laughs> yeah, the, you know, between this and, and Griff Grizzle was the other thing I was going to ask you about. Um, you know, some, yeah. some good solid horror work there. Um, and, and, you know, it's, it's cool that you guys can just kind of seemingly bounce ideas back and forth and they go, yeah, let's do it. And then all of a sudden you have a comic book. And, and I mean, that's more than what some people can say. So that's, uh, you know, a good, um, you know, a uh, track record for that kind of stuff. Absolutely. Well, I mean, at the end of the day, we just feel like we're kids playing with toys in a, you mm-hmm. know, in a sand pit. Um, we're just a, you know, a couple of guys that just love this kind of thing. And we just, we try and follow that fun. You know, if an idea is is a good idea, you're going to want to explore it. You're going to want to talk about it. You're going to want to work on it. And we just try and follow that sort of enthusiasm, you know, from Rob, from me, and just go wherever it takes us, really. And and like you say, it's like we just we just want to follow that fun and get it out there. And to us, it's just you know we love this, you know, and and it's so it's so nice being able to work in that collaborative way, um, because you can constantly surprise each other as well and, and come at things from angles that you yourself would never be able to. So, you know, Rob's forced me to write stories that I wouldn't have dared write and I think vice versa and, you know, take risks that on your own maybe you'd be a little bit more afraid to and it's just it's been a crazy journey over this last sort of four years really seeing where it's all taken. So it's only been four years that you guys have been working together? Yeah, I'd say maybe maybe a little bit longer because some of the stories that... um well, the weird thing with writing, and I'm sure this is probably true for a lot of people, the order that we write things in is absolutely not the order that things get released in. And there's some stories that are yet to be released that will be in, you know, future Herrera issues that were written earlier than things in the first issue. Um, there's a lot of, um, I mean, logistics is the big thing, really. I mean, every issue that we put out usually involves... I see. Now, I don't want to use the word compromise because that would suggest that there's something that impacts the quality, and that's not the case. But usually, how stories end up in the particular issues is due to just the way things land. Um, because usually, multiple artists are working on multiple things. Everybody's life is busy. You know, some people get time at different slots. And what we try and do is work around putting out the best quality releases based on the content that we have available to us at the time, if that makes sense. So there's some scripts that have been with artists for, you know, a fairly long period of time. And maybe they're slightly more difficult to draw or 
you know, the artist is just, just struggling to get it the way they just want it. But then other ideas are coming more naturally on another script. And so we tend to, you know, hop between different stories and just things are ready when things are ready, basically. And we try not to try not to worry too much about that side of things. But um yeah, it's a bit of a roller coaster in that in that respect. Um because there's one particular story that was was written a long, long time ago, um, which is sort of our I don't know, I don't want to give too much away, but it's sort of our yeah. Christmas story, I guess you'd say. Um and that's one that I'm desperate to get in there, but for one reason or another it just hasn't quite got to finished pages yet. But I'm hoping we're gonna have that ready for the collection, which is something that I haven't really talked about much, but it's something hopefully that's gonna be coming out hopefully next year hopefully well you guys have it seemed to have a good track record when it comes to uh using kickstarter for this kind of stuff too so i think you know you've built up an audience over the course of the the projects that you've run there that hopefully when you do uh intend to put out a, a collection whether it's for this or any of your other books um then you, you have that kind of like quick built-in audience to to fund it quickly and get it get it done that's exactly the plan. I mean, the collection that I'm talking about, what we want to do, I mean, this is, this is early, early stages. Um, we want to basically put everything that we've done for Herrera into one big trade paperback collection that will either be, you know, softback or hardback, depending on how the funding side of things goes. And that is ultimately something that we'd like to take to Kickstarter. But we're just kind of bouncing ideas around about the best way to do it at the moment. Um, cause we're toying with the idea of maybe the collection being the next thing that we release. And in that collection would be the next issue, essentially. Um, so there'd be plenty of new content in there, um, which would be the third part of the Grimoire story that's ran through the first two issues. Um, then that Christmas story hopefully will be in there. And there's another couple of scripts that are out there being worked on at the moment. And we're toying with the idea of having that as the next release or maybe releasing issue three first and then looking to collect mm -hmm. after that and so we're bouncing those ideas around at the moment but ultimately the plan is to take it to kickstarter like you say because i mean herrera's never been to kickstarter yet so we've got sort of a couple of different groups in terms of an audience as you mentioned you know we've got some people back us on kickstarter and don't follow us on twitter or facebook or, or anything else they only know our work when it when it lands on kickstarter and that's that that's all we are to them then we've got other people who um, are fans through Comic House, which is an app that we've got all of our books um, on, all the Madia stuff, all the Herrera, all Grip Gristle and everything is all on there. And some people have found us through that app. Again, don't know us through Kickstarter, don't know us through Twitter, Facebook or anything like that. And there's an audience over there. And then we've got the sort of people that we sort of direct sell to through Twitter, Facebook and those side of things there. So we've got these sort of disparate groups that um, we're selling our books to. And at the moment, Herrera has never been through Kickstarter. We've got the books on Comic House, so digital readers are reading it there. We've sold the books at conventions and through Facebook and Twitter over the last few years, but it's never seen Kickstarter. So I think I'm excited to see how it does there um, because it's always been, you know, an absolutely huge seller for us in all the other contexts. And it's been one of the ones that sort of critics have probably talked about most, I would say. So I'm excited to see how that does when it actually reaches Kickstarter. And I mean... We've just got so many incredible artists on the book as well, you know, over all the, the issues that we've put out. And I mean, when people see that art for the first time, you know, people who've never laid eyes on it, I think they're going to be really excited to get that in their hands. And to have a big book, you know, just covering everything that we've done is exciting for us as yeah. well. Because I mean, from a convention perspective, it's, it's hard to sell single issues without getting into all the boring business side of things. It's hard to keep them in stock and it's hard to try and sell someone an issue for when they've not read an issue one, two, or three. And as a, a writer, you're excited about issue four because it's the one you've just finished and you want people to read that. But if they haven't read the first three, you end up in an awkward no man's land where you've got to sell them four issues or just sell them the first issue and then you haven't given them the issue that you really wanted to give them. So it's exciting for us to try and get everything collected because then we've got one book that we can focus on selling. We've got everything in one place. We don't need to worry about reprints of previous issues. Um, and it just streamlines, you know, everything. And it means that people can take that one bite and get an awful lot for their money with it as well. Because through Kickstarter, we can usually keep things quite yeah. affordable. So people get a lot of pages for you know, a relatively low price. And that's obviously something we're incredibly excited to do. Hope, well, hoping it all goes well. And we should be able to do it with a relatively small funding target as well. 
But again, this is all stuff that we're bouncing around ideas for at the moment. But I'm hoping, I'm hoping it's something that we'll be able yeah, to do next always, year. Uh, that's super exciting. So it's a, it's a, I, you could hear the passion in your voice and be like, I can't wait to get this book on a shelf and be able to show people uh, about it because like it's it that's awesome. I mean, that's kind of the goal too. And plus that way. You know, you can you have something else to show them. I feel like trades move easily, e- e- more easier than single issues hey. with that kind of stuff, for all the reasons you mentioned too. Well, I mean, paperbacks. Um, as I mentioned before, paper cuts and ink stains. The anthology that we ran, we ran it through to issue six, and that was when we were really running into those problems of trying to sell, you know, later issues, and the table was getting yeah. cluttered. It was just getting complicated, and that's when we took. Um, what we called it paper backs and ink stains to Kickstarter and collected everything into, into one go there and colored it all up and made it into that one, you know, beautiful package. And that did incredibly well for us on Kickstarter. And it just, it, it was a real sort of dream realized for me because I mean, you know, I love everything that we've put out. Every single issue we've put out, I'm incredibly proud of. But I think once you've got a book with a spine with your name on it, on your own shelf, that was a huge landmark for me. And you know, the amount of work we've had to put into all of this over the last few years, I mean, we all work full-time jobs. Everything that we do, as you mentioned before, you know, we, we, we write, we edit, we do all the PR, we do all the, the Facebook, the Twitter, we negotiate with all the different companies like Comic House that we've got all of our books on there. We have to post out every single envelope. We run all our own Kickstarters. And this is all on top of full-time jobs that we're doing as well. Um, you know, Rob works, you know, in care work. He, he's got an incredibly stressful job. You know, Alistair, you know, works for Rockstar as a senior illustrator. So he's an incredibly busy man. And it's, it's a lot of work for all of us. And when you can hit that kind of point where with paperbacks, we had, you know, a book with like 250 pages long that was solely down to us. It was an incredible moment for me. And I, I really want to get there with Herrera as well, because it's such a passion project for me. And to have that, you know, next to um, paperbacks on my shelf is just going to be an incredible moment for me. That's great. Um, is there, with the um, anthology setup, like like you said, it's kind of like a something for everybody with that. Is Are there, I guess, do you have a, uh, no, nah, it's a shitty question. I was going to say, like, do you have like a favorite? But I mean, like, it's kind of like the, uh, you know, the way of choosing between your children in that case. But I guess if you're kind of covering it and you're also, you know, I started asking this question before really figuring it out in my head. And I think that, no, you kind of covered it already. And the fact that like, well, you, you have all these different plates in the air, you're spinning around going, all right, we're going to get this here. You have a Christmas story you have this story you have that story. So one way or the other, you're going to be able to kind of just tell a whole bunch of different stories to scratch every kind of horror itch that you might have at a, at a moment. Yeah, well, I think as well, um, comics are tough for horror. And I think that's something that drew us to it as well, because, I mean, it's sort of, there's a million articles on this, people talking about saying, you know, horror is incredibly difficult to do in comics. And I think the reason why, I mean, if you think about um, a novel or prose writing, you can use a lot of words and leave things very vague. And that vague is usually, the vagueness is usually what makes things scary because it allows your own imagination to create something that's scary for you. And the the words are more sort of a suggestion and you take it to where where scares you. Then I think with, you know, cinema um, or TV, a lot of the time sound is an incredibly powerful tool. You know, I mean... It's, it's also an incredibly lazy way of making scares in, in film and TV as well. You know, you think about some terrible horror films over the years that have basically just used yeah. the jump scare. And all that is, is, you know, the sound just gets incredibly loud for a second. And I mean, even if it was a kid's film that had that spike in volume, you'd jump out your chair. So it's like sound is an incredibly powerful tool used in, in bad ways, but also in incredible ways as well. You know, it's used to create that atmosphere of dread in, in so many things and, as well as with the visuals, it just creates this sort of soup where you can build anxiety in people. But with comics, it's hard because you've got concrete art. The picture is the picture. It's right there. So it doesn't leave any room for imagination in terms of the monster. You know, you are staring at it. It's right there in front of you. And also, there's no sound. The pacing is almost controlled by the reader more than the... I mean, obviously, there's there's ways that you can control the pacing as a writer and an artist, but... Ultimately, a lot of it is out of your hands. So there's so many roadblocks to making something genuinely scary that it, that was kind of something that was exciting to us to try and find ways that we could get under people's skin. So I think we tried to find different ways of doing that and different things to explore. So, I mean, like 
in Laudanum, for example, you know, in that one, it's a story really about people, people unraveling. Because, I mean, it's it's an exorcism story in some ways on the surface of it. But the sort of subtext of it is, I mean, is this man really seeing these things? Are these things really happening to his wife? Because these two are, are in the house alone for the entirety of the story. He, there's obvious suggestions through the story that he has an addiction. And it's, this isn't really covered in the story, but we kind of had the idea that he was let go from his post in the church through his addiction. And so you start to think, well, hang on a minute, you know, is this more just a, a tale of sort of domestic problems? Is this a man that's completely unraveled and killed his wife in sort of a drug fueled haze? Or is it something supernatural? And then that kind of leaves it open in your mind and you can start to kind of imagine how you could unravel, you know, in these sort of contexts. And it's different ways that it can get under your skin as well as the obvious sort of on the surface exorcism story that you're reading. Um, and so we like to try and find little things, you know, that can kind of unsettle. And I mean, if you think about The Thin Place, which is a story in the second issue, um, in that one, we're kind of exploring the idea of the barriers between worlds being thinner in, in different areas, which is, you know, it's a theme that's been explored in a lot of different things. But the idea that we were talking about how, you know, when you feel the hairs on your neck stand up, that's when something is potentially reaching through and actually physically making contact with your skin from somewhere else. It leaves that idea in people's mind that the next time they feel that sensation for whatever reason, they might think back to that idea. And so the horror sort of lingers and stays with you. And we like to try and find ways that, you know, the story can stay in people's minds after they've read it. So instead of being a sort of impact horror, bang, here's the scary thing. It's like you read the story and it's unsettling. But then you might think about it in six months time when you're walking through a graveyard <laughs> and you feel that prickle on the back of your neck. And so it's like we just like to try and, you know, creep under people's skin in that sense and, and just leave something that's going to spin around in your head. And I mean, again, in the, in the Halloween special, the, the latest issue that we just put out that's going to be in print for Glasgow Comic Con, um, in the last story in that one, Do You Want to See, um, where we're flicking between the two different time periods that you yourself mentioned in the review, what we were trying to do in that story was we were almost playing with the concept of time and sort of basically the idea of not really necessarily being able to trust your own memories and things that you've experienced and blur in those particular lines because the narrative trick that we used in that one where we're flicking between the two separate time periods but the story flows through in one way at the end of the story you almost feel like you've read twice as much yeah. story because your brain has sort of connected the dots like when we leave the kids descending the stairs and then we pick up with the bandits you know walking down the stairs and being at the bottom of the stairs, and then we flip back to the kids, you feel like you followed the kids down the stairs too, even though you never actually saw that happen. So in a sense, you're remembering things that you never really read, and we're sort of playing with sort of memory and time and and essentially kind of tricking your own brain in ways. And so we, we just like to try and find odd things to explore like that, to, to try and find ways to... Make horror comics scary, yeah, I guess. Yeah, well, look, uh, mission accomplished on, on that front. And thank you for reminding me uh, about Laudanum because that was such a creepy ass book. Um, like, <laughs> I, I think I had named it, like, when it came out, that was one of my top, uh, horror comics of the year because, like, it just, it was such a, it was like a, it's, it's a short story, but it's just yeah. so, like, interesting and friggin' scary. Like, it, you're, like, you're writing that gets under your yeah. skin kind of quality, and it, it, it definitely delivered on that. <laughs> and I was like, oh, this is perfect. I really appreciate so I, that. Yeah, that's, it's one of the pieces yeah. that we're most proud of, that one. Um, which is why it, you know, essentially was a standalone piece. Um, we really wanted to use that as sort of the, um, gateway drug into what we were doing because we, produce that in print for Thought Bubble, which is a convention that we do every year, which is a, a big one that we love to do. And with it being the short length, we were able to print it and have it on sale for only £2, which is essentially half the price of most of the comics on sale right. at the convention. So we just wanted to get them into as many hands as we possibly could. So having the shorter length meant that we could sell it at half the price, and we felt that it gave such a good sort of bang for that book. And I think it led a lot of people into reading the other issues. You know, it was a lot of people would come through on the first day of the convention, pick that up because it was cheap. And then they'd come back on the second day and buy everything else. 
you know it just gave people that taste of what we were doing so it gave that nice sort of low price point for people to to give it a go without taking too big of a risk and as you say we felt the story was so strong that it was nice to have it as this little standalone piece that um would stick in people's minds and they wouldn't be able to forget <laughs> yeah i mean it, it definitely it definitely worked well um look i i i know we i i unfortunately have to wrap this up um soonish uh, do, uh, you know like i said before my uh my day job is calling but the uh i want to make sure we highlight so you're gonna you're gonna be at glasgow comic-con and you're gonna have print copies yes. of horror number three for the first time ever uh so so fans yes. could, uh, do you have a booth or something there uh yeah we we've got a table there where we're going to be selling everything that we do it's going to be full of madius it's going to be full of her it's going to be full of everything that we do me and rob are both there um we'll be signing comics we'll be dishing out high fives and, and handshakes to anyone that wants one um we're there to chat comics with anyone that just wants to come and, and say hello we're gonna have books on sale as well so yeah make sure you come and see us i don't have a table number or anything to give you at the moment because i don't think those have been confirmed yet but it's only sort of 10 days away and I, it's not a huge one it's not a huge convention people are going we'll be able to find us we'll be there with a the big madius banner behind us and waving her and comics in the air uh, the, the if folks want to find it uh digitally or something they could where where's the best places for folks to find it there yeah, um, you can go onto the Comic House app, uh, which is C O M I C H A U S. Um, if you go to their website, you can download the app through uh, App Store, Android, anything like that. Read on tablets. It's got a monthly subscription, but it's got free trials. All of our books are on there that we've talked about. Griff Gristle, all the paper cuts, all the Herrera stuff, mm-hmm. all on there. Uh, if you don't want to sign up for that and you just want to download the issues, you can get them from our Pay Hip store. Uh, which is just payhip.com forward slash Herrera, H-O-R-R-E-R-E. And that's got all the digital issues up on there for ridiculously cheap. So you can go and just buy them there and, and do whatever you want with them. Um, read them on a PC, read them on a, a tablet, a phone again. You can do what you want with them there. And if you want print copies, you can go to Alistair Wood's um, Big Cartel page, which I'm not 100% sure of the address. I think it's it's uh, bigcartel.com forward slash Woody I'll, or something I'll like that. And, but uh, I'll if you go and put the, it in the show notes just to yeah, make sure. If you go to our yeah our Twitter, they basically Herrera Comic Twitter, which is just at Herrera Comic, um, you'll be able to find everything through that. It's all linked through that in the the um, pinned post, so cool. it's all and, there. Uh, and where are you on Twitter at? at um... Yeah, my Twitter handle makes no sense at all, which is at Rapiagi, which is R A P I A G H I. Okay, and uh, and and Maddius Comics can be found on Twitter as well. <laughs> Absolutely, again, it's just at Maddius Comics, M A D I U S so, Comics. Michael, I think I think what I want to do is maybe after Glasgow, uh, I want to get you and Rob on the show together. Um, well, let's figure that out, Absolutely. and we'll we'll, we'll we'll chat more about uh, about this stuff because we didn't get, we didn't get to touch much on Griff Gristle, Griff Gristle, and I want to make sure I uh, we talk about that because I'm I'm very interested to hear if there's more coming um, for that Monster Hunter. Well, a little quick tease. There oh. absolutely is. The third issue is on the way and is being drawn right now as we speak. And I'm, I know we can't get into it too much now, but to give you a quick taster, I shouldn't even be telling you this. <laughs> In that issue, there is three double page splashes that all run into each other so double page splash turn the page double page oh, splash great. turn the page double page splash wait. as well so that gives you an idea of how big we're going <laughs> for this next one it's going to be the longest issue yet as well and there's going to be some bombshells in that but yes for the next one i'll see if i can get rob along and even see if we can get yeah. alistair along he's been incredibly busy lately with red dead redemption and everything coming up but um hopefully we can get the three of us on here and one thing i'm annoyed i didn't get a chance to talk about was all the incredible artists that, that we work with by name there's just too many people to, to name in the quick time that we've had today, but next time we need to drill into everyone individually and talk about how Absolutely. amazing they we'll, are. We'll make that sooner rather than later, so uh, we'll definitely get in touch. And uh, yeah, but again, if uh, if you're going to Glasgow Comic Con, be sure to be sure to look it up. But otherwise, you know, look it look it up on digitally. Uh, digitally, it's it's felt well worth checking out. So, um, all right, folks, that is it for this episode of Funny Book Splatter. I have been James Ferguson with my guest Michael Sambrook. You've been listening to Funny Book Splatter, a horror comics podcast brought to you by HorrorTalk.com. We've been bringing you the best in horror since 2002. In addition to comics, we cover movies, TV shows, books, and video games. We've got news, reviews, guest features, interviews, unboxing videos, and much more. Be sure to sign up to Steve's Deals newsletter to increase your horror collection without breaking the bank. Check us out at HorrorTalk.com and at HorrorTalk on Twitter.